Chapter Sixteen of *The Person and Work of the Holy Spirit* by R. A. Torrey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter Sixteen: The Holy Spirit as a Teacher. Our Lord Jesus, in his last conversation with his disciples before his crucifixion, said, "But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you." john chapter fourteen verse twenty six here we have a twofold work of the holy spirit teaching and bringing to remembrance the things which christ had already taught we will take them in the reverse order one the holy spirit brings to remembrance the words of christ this promise was made primarily to the apostles and is the guarantee of the accuracy of their report of what jesus said but the holy spirit does a similar work with each believer who expects it of him and who looks to him to do it the holy spirit brings to our mind the teachings of christ and of the word just when we need them for either the necessities of our life or of our service many of us could tell of occasions when we were in great distress of soul or great questioning as to duty or great extremity as to what to say to one whom we were trying to lead to christ or to help and at that exact moment the very scripture we needed some passage it may be we had not thought of for a long time and quite likely of which we had never thought in this connection was brought to mind who did it the holy spirit did it he is ready to do it even more frequently if we only expect it of him and look to him to do it it is our privilege every time we sit down beside an inquirer to point him to the way of life to look up to the holy spirit and say just what shall i say to this inquirer just what scripture shall i use there is a deep significance in the fact that in the verse immediately following this precious promise jesus says peace i leave you my peace i give unto you it is by the spirit bringing his words to remembrance and teaching us the truth of god that we obtain and abide in this peace if we will simply look to the holy spirit to bring to mind scripture just when we need it and just the scripture we need we shall indeed have christ's peace every moment of our lives one who is preparing for christian work came to me in great distress he said he must give up his preparation for he could not memorize the scriptures i am thirty-two years old he said and have been in business now for years i have gotten out of the habit of study and i cannot memorize anything the man longed to be in his master's service and the tears stood in his eyes as he said it don't be discouraged i replied take your lord's promise that the holy spirit will bring his words to remembrance learn one passage of scripture fix it firmly in your mind then another and then another and look to the holy spirit to bring them to your remembrance when you need them he went on with his preparation he trusted the holy spirit afterwards he took up work in a very difficult field a field where all sorts of error abounded they would gather around him on the street like bees and he would take his bible and trust the holy spirit to bring to remembrance the passages of scripture that he needed and he did it his adversaries were filled with confusion as he met them at every point with the sure word of god and many of the most hardened were one for christ two the holy spirit will teach us all things there is a still more explicit promise to this effect two chapters further on in john chapter sixteen verses twelve to fourteen revised version here jesus says i have yet many things to say unto you but ye cannot bear them now howbeit when he the spirit of truth is come he shall guide you into all the truth for he shall not speak from himself but what things soever he shall hear these shall he speak and he shall declare unto you the things that are to come he shall glorify me for he shall take of mine and shall declare it unto you this promise was made in the first instance to the apostles but the apostles themselves applied it to all believers first john chapter two verses twenty and twenty seven it is the privilege of each believer in jesus christ even the humblest to be taught of god each humblest believer is independent of human teachers ye need not that any teach you first john chapter two verse twenty seven revised version this of course does not mean that we may not learn much from others who are taught of the holy spirit if john had thought that he would never have written this epistle to teach others the man who is the most fully taught of god is the very one who will be most ready to listen to what god has taught others much less does it mean that when we are taught of the spirit we are independent of the word of god for the word is the very place to which the spirit who is the author of the word leads his pupils 
and the instrument through which he instructs them ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 john chapter 6 verse 33 ephesians chapter 5 verses 18 and 19 compare colossians chapter 3 verse 16 but while we may learn much from men we are not dependent upon them we have a divine teacher the holy spirit we shall never truly know the truth until we are thus taught directly by the holy spirit no amount of mere human teaching no matter who our teachers may be will ever give us a correct and exact and full apprehension of the truth not even a diligent study of the word either in the english or in the original languages will give us a real understanding of the truth we must be taught directly by the holy spirit and we may be thus taught each one of us the one who is thus taught will understand the truth of god better even if he does not know one word of greek or hebrew than the one who knows greek and hebrew thoroughly and all the cognate languages as well but who is not taught of the spirit the spirit will guide the one whom he thus teaches into all the truth the whole sphere of god's truth is for each one of us but the holy spirit will not guide us into all the truth in a single day nor in a week nor in a year but step by step there are two especial lines of the spirit's teaching mentioned one he shall declare unto you the things that are to come there are many who say we can know nothing of the future that all our thoughts on that subject are guesswork it is true that we cannot know everything about the future there are some things which god has seen fit to keep to himself secret things which belong to him deuteronomy chapter twenty nine verse twenty nine for example we cannot know the times or the seasons of our lord's return acts chapter one verse seven but there are many things about the future which the holy spirit will reveal to us two he shall glorify me that is christ for he shall take of mine and shall declare it unto you this is the holy spirit's especial line of teaching with the believer as with the unbeliever jesus christ it is his work above all else to reveal jesus christ and to glorify him his whole teaching centers in christ from one point of view or the other he is always bringing us to jesus christ there are some who fear to emphasize the truth about the holy spirit lest christ himself be disparaged and put in the background but there is no one who magnifies christ as the holy spirit does we shall never understand christ nor see his glory until the holy spirit interprets him to us no amount of listening to sermons and lectures no matter how able no amount of mere study of the word even would ever give us to see the things of christ the holy spirit must show us and he is willing to do it and he can do it he is longing to do it the holy spirit's most intense desire is to reveal jesus christ to men on the day of pentecost when peter and the rest of the company were filled with the holy spirit they did not talk much about the holy spirit they talked about christ study peter's sermon on that day jesus christ was his one theme and jesus christ will be our one theme if we are taught of the spirit jesus christ will occupy the whole horizon of our vision we will have a new christ a glorious christ christ will be so glorious to us that we will long to go and tell everyone about this glorious one whom we have found jesus christ is so different when the spirit glorifies him by taking his things and showing them unto us three the holy spirit reveals to us the deep things of god which are hidden from and are foolishness to the natural man we read in first corinthians chapter two verses nine to thirteen i hath not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which god hath prepared for them that love him but god hath revealed them unto us by his spirit for the spirit searcheth all things yea the deep things of god for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual this passage of course refers primarily to the apostles but we cannot limit this work of the spirit to them the spirit reveals to the individual believer the deep things of god things which human eye hath not seen nor ear heard things which hath not entered into the heart of man the things which god hath prepared for them that love him 
it is evident from the context that this does not refer solely to heaven or the things to come in the life hereafter the holy spirit takes the deep things of god which god hath prepared for us even in the life that now is and reveals them to us four the holy spirit interprets his own revelation he imparts power to discern know and appreciate what he has taught in the next verse to those just quoted we read but the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of god for they are foolishness unto him neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned first corinthians chapter three verse fourteen not only is the holy spirit the author of revelation the written word of god he is also the interpreter of what he has revealed any profound book is immeasurably more interesting and helpful when we have the author of the book right at hand to interpret it to us and it is always our privilege to have the author of the bible right at hand when we study it the holy spirit is the author of the bible and he stands ready to interpret its meaning to every believer every time he opens the book to understand the book we must look to him then the darkest places become clear we often need to pray with the psalmist of old open thou mine eyes that i may behold wondrous things out of thy law psalm 119 verse 18 it is not enough that we have the revelation of god before us in the written word to study we must also have the inward illumination of the holy spirit to enable us to apprehend it as we study it is a common mistake but a most palpable mistake to try to comprehend a spiritual revelation with the natural understanding it is the foolish attempt to do this that has landed so many in the bog of so-called higher criticism in order to understand art a man must have aesthetic sense as well as the knowledge of colors and of paint and a man to understand a spiritual revelation must be taught of the spirit a mere knowledge of the languages in which the bible was written is not enough a man with no aesthetic sense might as well expect to appreciate the sistine madonna because he is not color-blind as a man who is not filled with the spirit to understand the bible simply because he understands the vocabulary and the laws of grammar of the languages in which the bible was written we might as well think of setting a man to teach art because he understood paints as to set a man to teach the bible because he has a thorough understanding of greek and hebrew in our day we need not only to recognize the utter insufficiency and worthlessness before god of our own righteousness which is the lesson of the opening chapters of the epistle to the romans but also the utter insufficiency and worthlessness in the things of god of our own wisdom which is the lesson of the first epistle to the corinthians especially the first to the third chapters see for example first corinthians chapter one verses nineteen to twenty one twenty six and twenty seven the jews of old had a revelation by the spirit but they failed to depend upon the spirit himself to interpret it to them so they went astray so christians today have a revelation by the spirit and many are failing to depend upon the holy spirit to interpret it to them and so they go astray the whole evangelical church recognizes theoretically at least the utter insufficiency of man's own righteousness what it needs to be taught in the present hour and what it needs to be made to feel is the utter insufficiency of man's wisdom that is perhaps the lesson which this twentieth century of towering intellectual conceit needs most of any to learn to understand god's word we must empty ourselves utterly of our own wisdom and rest in utter dependence upon the spirit of god to interpret it to us we do well to lay to heart the words of jesus himself in matthew chapter eleven verse twenty five i thank thee o father lord of heaven and earth because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes a number of bible students were once discussing the best methods of bible study and one man who was in point of fact a learned and scholarly man said i think the best method of bible study is the baby method when we have entirely put away our own righteousness then and only then we get the righteousness of god philippians chapter three verses four to seven and nine romans chapter ten verse three and when we have entirely put away our own wisdom then and only then we get the wisdom of god let no man deceive himself says the apostle paul if any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world let him become a fool that he may be wise first corinthians chapter three verse eighteen and the emptying must precede filling the self poured out so that god may be poured in we must daily be taught by the spirit to understand the word 
we cannot depend today on the fact that the scripture taught us yesterday each new time that we come in contact with the word it must be in the power of the spirit for that specific occasion that the holy spirit once illumined our mind to grasp a certain truth is not enough he must do it each time we confront that passage andrew murray has well said each time you come to the word in study in hearing a sermon or reading a religious book there ought to be as distinct as your intercourse with the external means the definite act of self-abnegation denying your own wisdom and yielding yourself in faith to the divine teacher the spirit of christ page 221 5 the holy spirit enables the believer to communicate to others in power the truth he himself has been taught paul says in first corinthians chapter 2 verses 1 to 5 and i brethren when i came to you came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of god for i determined not to know anything among you save jesus christ and him crucified and i was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of god in a similar way in writing to the believers in thessalonica in first thessalonians chapter one verse five for our gospel came not unto you in word only but also in power and in the holy ghost and in much assurance as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake we need not only the holy spirit to reveal the truth to chosen apostles and prophets in the first place and the holy spirit in the second place to interpret to us as individuals the truth he has thus revealed but in the third place we need the holy spirit to enable us to effectually communicate to others the truth which he has himself interpreted to us we need him all along the line one great cause of real failure in the ministry even when there is seeming success and not only in the regular ministry but in all forms of service as well comes from the attempt to teach by enticing words of man's wisdom that is by the arts of human logic rhetoric persuasion and eloquence what the holy spirit has taught us what is needed is holy ghost power demonstration of the spirit and of power there are three causes of failure in preaching today first some other message is taught than the message which the holy spirit has revealed in the word men preach science art literature philosophy sociology history economics experience etc and not the simple word of god as found in the holy spirit's book the bible second the spirit taught message of the bible is studied and sought to be apprehended by the natural understanding that is without the spirit's illumination how common that is even in institutions where men are being trained for the ministry even in institutions which may be altogether orthodox third the spirit given message the word the bible studied and apprehended under the holy ghost's illumination is given out to others with enticing words of man's wisdom and not in demonstration of the spirit and of power we need and we are absolutely dependent upon the spirit all along the line he must teach us how to speak as well as what to speak his must be the power as well as the message end of chapter 16chapter 17 of the person and work of the holy spirit by r a tory this librivox recording is in the public domain read by marianne chapter 17 praying returning thanks worshiping in the holy spirit two of the most deeply significant passages in the bible on the subject of the holy spirit and on the subject of prayer are found in jude 20 and ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 in jude 20 we read but ye beloved building up yourselves on your most holy faith praying in the holy ghost and in ephesians chapter 6 verse 18 praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints these passages teach us distinctly that the holy spirit guides the believer in prayer the disciples did not know how to pray as they ought so they came to jesus and said lord teach us to pray luke chapter 11 verse 1 we today do not know how to pray as we ought we do not know what to pray for nor how to ask for it but there is one who is always at hand to help john chapter 14 verses 16 and 17 
and he knows what we should pray for he helps our infirmity in this matter of prayer as in other matters romans chapter eight verse twenty six revised version he teaches us to pray true prayer is prayer in the spirit i e the prayer that the holy spirit inspires and directs the prayer in which the holy spirit leads us is the prayer according to the will of god romans chapter eight verse twenty seven when we ask anything according to god's will we know that he hears us and we know that he has granted the things that we ask first john chapter five verses fourteen and fifteen we may know it is ours at the moment when we pray just as surely as we know it afterwards when we have it in our actual possession but how can we know the will of god when we pray in two ways first of all by what is written in his word all the promises in the bible are sure and if god promises anything in the bible we may be sure it is his will to give us that thing but there are many things that we need which are not specifically promised in the word and still even in that case it is our privilege to know the will of god for it is the work of the holy spirit to teach us god's will and lead us out in prayer along the line of god's will some object to the christian doctrine of prayer for they say that it teaches that we can go to god in our ignorance and change his will and subject his infinite wisdom to our erring foolishness but that is not the christian doctrine of prayer at all the christian doctrine of prayer is that it is the believer's privilege to be taught by the spirit of god himself to know what the will of god is and not to ask for the things that our foolishness would prompt us to ask for but to ask for things that the never erring spirit of god prompts us to ask for true prayer is prayer in the spirit that is the prayer which the spirit inspires and directs when we come into god's presence we should recognize our infirmity our ignorance of what is best for us our ignorance of what we should pray for our ignorance of how we should pray for it and in the consciousness of our utter inability to pray aright look up to the holy spirit to teach us to pray and cast ourselves utterly upon him to direct our prayers and to lead out our desires and guide our utterance of them there is no place where we need to recognize our ignorance more than we do in prayer rushing heedlessly into god's presence and asking for the first thing that comes into our minds or that some other thoughtless one asks us to pray for is not praying in the holy spirit and is not true prayer we must wait for the holy spirit and surrender ourselves to the holy spirit the prayer that god the holy spirit inspires is the prayer that god the father answers the longings which the holy spirit begets in our hearts are often too deep for utterance too deep apparently for clear and definite comprehension on the part of the believer himself in whom the spirit is working the spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered romans chapter eight verse twenty six revised version god himself must search the heart to know what is the mind of the spirit in these unuttered and unutterable longings but god does know what is in the mind of the spirit he does know what these spirit-given longings which we cannot put into words mean even if we do not and these longings are according to the will of god and god grants them it is in this way that it comes to pass that god is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us ephesians chapter three verse twenty there are other times when the spirit's leadings are so clear that we pray with the spirit and with the understanding also first corinthians chapter fourteen verse fifteen we distinctly understand what it is that the holy spirit leads us to pray for two the holy spirit inspires the believer and guides him in thanksgiving as well as in prayer we read in ephesians chapter five verses eighteen to twenty revised version and be not drunk with wine wherein is riot but be filled with the spirit speaking one to another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody with your heart to the lord giving thanks always for all things in the name of our lord jesus christ to god even the father not only does the holy spirit teach us to pray he also teaches us to render thanks one of the most prominent characteristics of the spirit-filled life is thanksgiving on the day of pentecost when the disciples were filled with the holy spirit and spoke as the spirit gave them utterance we hear them telling the wonderful works of god acts chapter two verses four and eleven and today when any believer is filled with the holy spirit he always becomes filled with thanksgiving and praise true thanksgiving is to god even the father through or in the name of our lord jesus christ in the holy spirit three the holy spirit inspires worship on the part of the believer we read in philippians chapter three verse three revised version 
for we are the circumcision who worship by the spirit of god and glory in christ jesus and have no confidence in the flesh prayer is not worship thanksgiving is not worship worship is a definite act of the creature in relation to god worship is bowing before god in adoring acknowledgment and contemplation of himself and the perfection of his being someone has said in our prayers we are taken up with our needs in our thanksgiving we are taken up with our blessings in our worship we are taken up with himself there is no true and acceptable worship except that which the holy spirit prompts and directs god is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth for such doth the father seek to be his worshippers john chapter four verse twenty four and twenty three the flesh seeks to intrude into every sphere of life the flesh has its worship as well as the lusts the worship which the flesh prompts is an abomination unto god in this we see the folly of any attempt at a congress of religions where the representatives of radically different religions attempt to worship together not all earnest and honest worship is worship in the spirit a man may be very honest and very earnest in his worship and still not have submitted himself to the guidance of the holy spirit in the matter and so his worship is in the flesh oftentimes even when there is great loyalty to the letter of the word worship may not be in the spirit i e inspired and directed by him to worship aright as paul puts it we must have no confidence in the flesh that is we must recognize the utter inability of the flesh our natural self as contrasted to the divine spirit that dwells in and should mould everything in the believer to worship acceptably and we must also realize the danger that there is that the flesh intrude itself into our worship in utter self-distrust and self-abdignation we must cast ourselves upon the holy spirit to lead us aright in our worship just as we must renounce any merit in ourselves and cast ourselves upon christ and his work for us upon the cross for justification so we must renounce any supposed capacity for good in ourselves and cast ourselves utterly upon the holy spirit and his work in us in holy living knowing praying thanking and worshipping and all else that we are to do End of chapter 17chapter 18 of the person and work of the holy spirit by r a tory this librivox recording is in the public domain read by marianne chapter 18 the holy spirit sending men forth to definite lines of work we read in acts chapter 13 verses 2 to 4 as they ministered to the lord and fasted the holy ghost said separate me barnabas and saul for the work whereunto i have called them and when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them they sent them away so they being sent forth by the holy ghost departed unto seleucia and from thence they sailed to cyprus it is evident from this passage that the holy spirit calls men to definite lines of work and sends them forth into the work he not only calls men in a general way into christian work but selects the specific work and points it out many a one is asking to-day and many another ought to ask shall i go to china to africa to india there is only one person who can rightly settle that question for you and that person is the holy spirit you cannot settle the question for yourself much less can any other man settle it rightly for you not every christian man is called to go to china not every christian man is called to go to africa not every christian man is called to go to the foreign field at all god alone knows whether he wishes you in any of these places but he is willing to show you in a day such as we live in when there is such a need of the right men and right women in the foreign field every young and healthy and intellectually competent christian man and woman should definitely offer themselves to god for the foreign field and ask him if he wants them to go but they ought not to go until he by his holy spirit makes it plain the great need in all lines of christian work to-day is men and women whom the holy ghost calls and sends forth we have plenty of men and women whom men have called and sent forth we have plenty of men and women who have called themselves for there are many to-day who object strenuously to being sent forth by men by any organization of any kind but in fact are what is immeasurably worse sent forth by themselves and not by god how does the holy spirit call the passage before us does not tell us how the holy spirit spoke to the group of prophets and teachers in antioch telling them to separate barnabas and saul to the work to which he had called them 
it is presumably purposefully silent on this point possibly it is silent on this point lest we should think that the holy spirit must always call in precisely the same way there is nothing whatever to indicate that he spoke by an audible voice much less is there anything to indicate that he made his will known in any of the fantastic ways in which some in these days profess to discern his leading as for example by twitchings of the body by shuddering by opening of the bible at random and putting his finger on a passage that may be construed into some entirely different meaning than that which the inspired author intended by it the important point is he made his will clearly known and he is willing to make his will clearly known to us today sometimes he makes it known in one way and sometimes in another but he will make it known but how shall we receive the holy spirit's call first of all by desiring it second by earnestly seeking it third by waiting upon the lord for it fourth by expecting it the record reads as they ministered to the lord and fasted they were waiting upon the lord for his direction for the time being they had turned their back utterly upon worldly cares and enjoyments even upon those things which were perfectly proper in their place many a man is saying to-day in justification for his staying home from the foreign field i have never had a call but how do you know that have you been listening for a call god usually speaks in a still small voice and it is only the listening ear that can catch it have you ever definitely offered yourself to god to send you where he will while no man or woman ought to go to china or africa or other foreign field unless they are clearly and definitely called they ought each to offer themselves to god for this work and be ready for the call and be listening sharply that they may hear the call if it comes let it be borne distinctly in mind that a man needs no more definite call to africa than to boston or new york or london or any other desirable field at home the holy spirit not only calls men and sends them forth into definite lines of work but he also guides the details of daily life and service as to where to go and where not to go what to do and what not to do we read in acts chapter eight verses twenty seven to twenty nine revised version and he philip arose and went and behold a man of ethiopia a eunuch of great authority under candace queen of the ethiopians who was over all her treasure who had come to jerusalem for to worship and he was returning and sitting in his chariot and reading the prophet isaiah and the spirit said unto philip go near and join thyself to this chariot here we see the spirit guiding philip in the details of service into which he had called him in a similar way we read in acts chapter sixteen verses six and seven revised version and they went through the region of phrygia and galatia having been forbidden of the holy ghost to speak the word in asia and when they were come over against mysia they essayed to go into bithynia and the spirit of jesus suffered them not here we see the holy spirit directing paul where not to go it is possible for us to have the unerring guidance of the holy spirit at every turn of life take for example our personal work it is manifestly not god's intention that we speak to every one we meet to attempt to do so would be to attempt the impossible and we would waste much time in trying to speak to people where we could do no good that might be used in speaking to people where we could accomplish something there are some to whom it would be wise for us to speak there are others to whom it would be unwise for us to speak time spent on them would be taken from work that would be more to god's glory doubtless as philip journeyed towards gaza he met many before he met the one whom the spirit said go near and join thyself to this chariot the spirit is as ready to guide us as he was to guide philip some years ago a christian worker in toronto had the impression that he should go to the hospital and speak to someone there he thought to himself whom do i know at the hospital at this time there came to his mind one he knew was at the hospital and he hurried to the hospital but as he sat down by his side to talk with him he realized it was not for this man that he was sent he got up to lift a window what did it all mean there was another man lying across the passage from the man he knew and the thought came to him that this might be the man to whom he should speak and he turned and spoke to this man and had the privilege of leading him to christ there was apparently nothing serious in the man's case he had suffered some injury to his knee and there was no thought of a serious issue but that man passed into eternity that night many instances of a similar character could be recorded 
and prove from experience that the holy spirit is as ready to guide those who seek his guidance to-day as he was to guide the early disciples but he is ready to guide us not only in our more definite forms of christian work but in all the affairs of life business study everything we have to do there is no promise in the bible more plainly explicit than james chapter one verses five to seven revised version but if any of you lack wisdom let him ask of god who giveth to all liberally and upbraideth not and it shall be given him but let him ask in faith nothing doubting for he that doubteth is like the surge of the sea driven by the wind and tossed for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the lord this passage not only promises god's wisdom but tells us specifically just what to do to obtain it there are really five steps stated or implied in the passage one that we lack wisdom we must be conscious of and fully admit our own inability to decide wisely here is where oftentimes we fail to receive god's wisdom we think we are able to decide for ourselves or at least we are not ready to admit our own utter inability to decide there must be an entire renunciation of the wisdom of the flesh two we must really desire to know god's way and be willing at any cost to do god's will this is implied in the word ask the asking must be sincere and if we are not willing to do god's will whatever it may be at any cost the asking is not sincere this is a point of fundamental importance there is nothing that goes so far to make our minds clear in the discernment of the will of god as revealed by his spirit as an absolutely surrendered will here we find the reason why men oftentimes do not know god's will and have the spirit's guidance they are not willing to do whatever the spirit leads at any cost it is he that willeth to do his will who shall know not only the doctrine but he shall know his daily duty men oftentimes come to me and say i cannot find out the will of god but when i put to them the question are you willing to do the will of god at any cost they admit that they are not the way that is very obscure when we hold back from an absolute surrender to god becomes clear as day when we make that surrender three we must definitely ask guidance it is not enough to desire it is not enough to be willing to obey we must ask definitely ask god to show us the way four we must confidently expect guidance let him ask in faith nothing doubting there are many and many who cannot find the way though they ask god to show it to them simply because they have not the absolutely undoubting expectation that god will show them the way god promises to show it if we expect it confidently when you come to god in prayer to show you what to do know for a certainty that he will show you in what way he will show you he does not tell but he promises that he will show you and that is enough we must follow step by step as the guidance comes as said before just how it will come no one can tell but it will come oftentimes only a step will be made clear at a time that is all we need to know the next step many are in darkness because they do not know and cannot find what god would have them do next week or next month or next year a college man once came to me and told me that he was in great darkness about god's guidance that he had been seeking to find the will of god and learn what his life's work should be but he could not find it i asked him how far along he was in his college course he said his sophomore year i asked what is it you desire to know what shall i do when i finish college do you know that you ought to go through college yes this man not only knew what he ought to do next year but the year after but still he was in great perplexity because he did not know what he ought to do when these two years were ended god delights to lead his children a step at a time he leads us as he led the children of israel and when the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle then after that the children of israel journeyed and in the place where the cloud abode there the children of israel pitched their tents at the commandment of the lord the children of israel journeyed and at the commandment of the lord they pitched as long as the cloud abode upon the tabernacle they rested in their tents and when the cloud tarried long upon the tabernacle many days then the children of israel kept the charge of the lord and journeyed not and so it was when the cloud was a few days upon the tabernacle according to the commandment of the lord they journeyed and so it was when the cloud abode from even unto morning and that the cloud was taken up in the morning then they journeyed 
whether it was by day or by night that the cloud was taken up they journeyed or whether it was two days or a month or a year that the cloud tarried upon the tabernacle remaining thereon the children of israel abode in their tents and journeyed not but when it was taken up they journeyed at the commandment of the lord they rested in the tents and at the commandment of the lord they journeyed they kept the charge of the lord at the commandment of the lord by the hand of moses numbers chapter nine verses seventeen to twenty three men who have given themselves up to the leading of the holy spirit get into a place of great bondage and are tortured because they have leadings which they fear may be from god but of which they are not sure if they do not obey these leadings they are fearful they have disobeyed god and sometimes fancy that they have grieved away the holy spirit because they did not follow his leading this is all unnecessary let us settle it in our minds that god's guidance is clear guidance god is light and in him is no darkness at all first john chapter one verse five and any leading that is not perfectly clear is not from him that is if our wills are absolutely surrendered to him of course the obscurity may arise from an unsurrendered will but if our wills are absolutely surrendered to god we have the right as god's children to be sure that any guidance is from him before we obey it we have a right to go to our father and say heavenly father here i am i desire above all things to do thy will now make it clear to me thy child if this thing that i have a leading to do is thy will i will do it but make it clear as day if it be thy will if it is his will the heavenly father will make it clear as day and you need not and ought not to do that thing until he does make it clear and you need not and ought not to condemn yourself because you did not do it god does not want his children to be in a state of condemnation before him he wishes us to be free from all care worry anxiety and self-condemnation any earthly parent would make the way clear to his child that asked to know it and much more will our heavenly father make it clear to us and until he does make it clear we need have no fears that in not doing it we are disobeying god we have no right to dictate to god how he shall give his guidance as for example by asking him to shut up every way or by asking him to give a sign or by guiding us in putting our finger on a text or in any other way it is ours to seek and to expect wisdom but it is not ours to dictate how it shall be given the holy spirit divides to each man severally as he will first corinthians chapter twelve verse eleven two things are evident from what has been said about the work of the holy spirit first how utterly dependent we are upon the work of the holy spirit at every turn of the christian life and service second how perfect is the provision for life and service that god has made how wonderful is the fullness of privilege that is open to the humblest believer through the holy spirit's work it is not so much what we are by nature either intellectually morally physically or even spiritually that is important the important matter is what the holy spirit can do for us and what we will let him do not infrequently the holy spirit takes the one who seems to give the least natural promise and uses him far beyond those who give the greatest natural promise christian life is not to be lived in the realm of natural temperament and christian work is not to be done in the power of natural endowment but christian life is to be lived in the realm of the spirit and christian work is to be done on the power of the spirit the holy spirit is willing and eagerly desirous of doing for each one of us his whole work and he will do in each one of us all that we will let him do End of chapter 18。Chapter 19 of the Person and Work of the Holy Spirit by R. A. Torrey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 19. The Holy Spirit and the Believer's Body. The Holy Spirit does a work for our bodies as well as for our minds and hearts. We read in Romans chapter 8, verse 11, Revised Version. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwelleth in you, he that raised up Christ Jesus from the dead shall quicken also your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwelleth in you. The Holy Spirit quickens the mortal body of the believer. It is very evident from the context that this refers to the future resurrection of the body, verses 21 to 23. The resurrection of the body is the Holy Spirit's work. The glorified body is from him. It is a spiritual body. At the present time we have only the first fruits of the Spirit, 
and are waiting for the full harvest, the redemption of our body. Verse 23. There is, however, a sense in which the Holy Spirit even now quickens our bodies. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, that he cast out devils by the Spirit of God. And we read in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. In James chapter 5, verse 14, the apostle writes, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The oil in this passage, as elsewhere, is the type of the Holy Spirit, and the truth is set forth that the healing is the Holy Spirit's work. God, by his Holy Spirit, does impart new health and vigor to these mortal bodies in the present life. To go to the extremes that many do, and take the ground that the believer who is walking in fellowship with Christ need never be ill, is to go farther than the Bible warrants us in going. It is true that the redemption of our bodies is secured by the atoning work of Christ, but until the Lord comes, we only enjoy the first fruits of that redemption, and we are waiting, and sometimes groaning, for our full place as sons manifested in the redemption of our body. Romans chapter 8, verse 23. But while this is true, it is the clear teaching of Scripture, and a matter of personal experience on the part of thousands, that the life of the Holy Spirit does sweep through these bodies of ours in moments of weakness and of pain and sickness, imparting new health to them, delivering from pain and filling them with abounding life. It is our privilege to know the quickening touch of the Holy Spirit in these bodies, as well as in our minds and affections and will. It would be a great day for the Church, and for the glory of Jesus Christ, if Christians would renounce forever all the devil's counterfeits of the Holy Spirit's work, Christian science, mental healing, Emmanuelism, hypnotism, and the various other forms of occultism, and depend upon God, by the power of His Holy Spirit, to work that in these bodies of ours, which He in His unerring wisdom sees that we most need. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 Part 1 of The Person and Work of the Holy Spirit by R. A. Torrey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter 20 The Baptism with the Holy Spirit. Part 1. One of the most deeply significant phrases used in connection with the Holy Spirit in the Scriptures is baptized with the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist was the first to use this phrase. In speaking of himself and the coming one, he said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Matthew chapter 3 verse 11. The second with in this passage is in italics. It is not found in the Greek. There are not two different baptisms spoken of, the one with the Holy Ghost and one with fire, but one baptism with the holy wind and fire. Jesus afterwards used the same expression. In Acts chapter 1, verse 5, he says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When this promise of John the Baptist and of our Lord was fulfilled, in Acts chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Revised Version, we read, And there appeared unto them tongues parting asunder, like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Here we have another expression, filled with the Holy Spirit, used synonymously with baptized with the Holy Spirit. We read again in Acts chapter 10, verses 44 to 46, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues, and magnify God. Peter himself afterwards, describing this experience in Jerusalem, tells the story in this way. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? Acts chapter 11, verses 15 to 17. 
here peter distinctly calls the experience which came to cornelius and his household being baptized with the holy ghost so we see that the expression the holy ghost fell and the gift of the holy ghost are practically synonymous expressions with baptized with the holy ghost still other expressions are used to describe this blessing such as receive the holy ghost acts chapter two verse thirty eight and chapter nineteen verses two to six the holy ghost came upon them acts chapter nineteen verse two to six gift of the holy ghost hebrews chapter two verse four first corinthians chapter twelve verses four eleven and thirteen i send the promise of my father upon you and endued with power from on high luke chapter twenty four verse forty nine what is the baptism with the holy spirit in the first place the baptism with the holy spirit is a definite experience of which one may and ought to know whether he has received it or not this is evident from our lord's command to his disciples in luke chapter twenty four verse forty nine and in acts chapter one verse four that they should not depart from jerusalem to undertake the work which he had commissioned them to do until they had received this promise of the father it is also evident from the eighth chapter of acts fifteenth and sixteenth verses where we are distinctly told the holy spirit had not as yet fallen upon any of them it is evident also from the nineteenth chapter of the acts of the apostles the second verse revised version where paul put to the little group of disciples at ephesus the definite question did ye receive the holy ghost when ye believed it is evident that the receiving of the holy ghost was an experience so definite that one could answer yes or no to the question whether they had received the holy spirit in this case the disciples definitely answered no that they did not so much as hear whether the holy ghost was given they did not say what our authorized version makes them say that they did not so much as hear whether there was any holy ghost they knew that there was a holy ghost they knew furthermore that there was a definite promise of the baptism with the holy ghost but they had not heard that that promise had been as yet fulfilled paul told them that it had and took steps whereby they were definitely baptized with the holy spirit before that meeting closed it is equally evident from galatians chapter three verse two that the baptism with the holy spirit is a definite experience of which one may know whether he has received it or not in this passage paul says to the believers in galatia this only would i learn of you received ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith their receiving the spirit had been so definite as a matter of personal consciousness that paul could appeal to it as a ground for his argument in our day there is much talk about the baptism with the holy spirit and prayer for the baptism with the spirit that is altogether vague and indefinite men arise in meeting and pray that they may be baptized with the holy spirit and if you should go afterwards to one who offered the prayer and put to him the question did you receive what you asked were you baptized with the holy spirit it is quite likely that he would hesitate and falter and say i hope so but there is none of this indefiniteness in the bible the bible is clear as day on this as on every other point it sets forth an experience so definite and so real that one may know whether or not he has received the baptism with the holy spirit and can answer yes or no to the question have you received the holy ghost in the second place it is evident that the baptism with the holy ghost is an operation of the holy spirit distinct from and additional to his regenerating work this is evident from acts chapter one verse five for john truly baptized with water but ye shall be baptized with the holy ghost not many days hence it is clear then that the disciples had not as yet been baptized with the holy ghost that they were to be thus baptized not many days hence but the men to whom jesus spoke these words were already regenerate men they had been so pronounced by our lord himself he had said to them in john chapter fifteen verse three now ye are clean through the word which i have spoken unto you but what does clean through the word mean first peter chapter one verse twenty three answers this question being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of god which liveth and abideth for ever a little earlier on the same night jesus had said to them in john chapter thirteen verse ten revised version he that is bathed needeth not save wash his feet but is clean every whit and ye are clean but not all the lord jesus had pronounced that apostolic company clean i e regenerate men with the exception of the one who never was a regenerate man judas iscariot who should betray him see verse eleven the remaining eleven jesus christ had pronounced regenerate men 
yet he tells these same men in acts chapter one verse five that the baptism with the holy spirit was an experience that they had not as yet realized that still lay in the future so it is evident that it is one thing to be born again by the holy spirit through the word and something distinct from this and additional to it to be baptized with the holy spirit the same thing is evident from acts chapter eight verse twelve revised version compared with the fifteenth and sixteenth verses of the same chapter in the twelfth verse we read that a large company of disciples had believed the preaching of philip concerning the kingdom of god and the name of jesus christ and had been baptized into the name of the lord jesus verse sixteen revised version certainly in this company of baptized believers there were at least some regenerate persons whatever the true form of water baptism may be they undoubtedly had been baptized by the true form for the baptizing had been done by a spirit commissioned man but in the fifteenth and sixteenth verses we read when they that is peter and john were come down they prayed for them that they might receive the holy ghost for as yet he was fallen upon none of them only they had been baptized into the name of the lord jesus baptized believers they were baptized into the name of the lord jesus they had been regenerate men some of them most assuredly were and yet not one of them as yet had received or been baptized with the holy ghost so again it is evident that the baptism with the holy spirit is an operation of the holy spirit distinct from and additional to his regenerating work a man may be regenerated by the holy spirit and still not be baptized with the holy spirit in regeneration there is the impartation of life by the spirit's power and the one who receives it is saved in the baptism with the holy spirit there is the impartation of power and the one who receives it is fitted for service the baptism with the holy spirit however may take place at the moment of regeneration it did for example in the house of cornelius we read in acts chapter ten verse forty three that while peter was preaching he came to the point where he said concerning jesus to him bear all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins and at that point cornelius and his household believed and we read immediately while peter yet spake these words the holy ghost fell on all of them which heard the word and they of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with peter because that on the gentiles also was poured out the gift of the holy ghost the moment they believed the testimony about jesus they were baptized with the holy ghost even before they were baptized with water regeneration and the baptism with the holy spirit took place practically at the same moment and so they do in many an experience today it would seem as if in a normal condition of the church this would be the usual experience but the church is not in a normal condition today a very large part of the church is in the place where the believers in samaria were before peter and john came down and where the disciples in ephesus were before paul came and told them of their larger privilege baptized believers baptized into the name of the lord jesus baptized unto repentance and remission of sins but not as yet baptized with the holy ghost nevertheless the baptism with the holy spirit is the birthright of every believer it was purchased for us by the atoning death of christ and when he ascended to the right hand of the father he received the promise of the father and shed him forth upon the church and if any one to-day has not the baptism with the holy spirit as a personal experience it is because he has not claimed his birthright potentially every member of the body of christ is baptized with the holy spirit first corinthians chapter twelve verse thirteen for in one spirit we were all baptized into one body whether we be jews or gentiles whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit but there are many believers with whom that which is potentially theirs has not become a matter of real actual personal experience all men are potentially justified in the atoning death of jesus christ on the cross that his justification is provided for them and belongs to them romans chapter five verse eighteen revised version but what potentially belongs to every man each man must appropriate to himself by faith in christ then justification is actually and experimentally his and just so while the baptism with the holy spirit is potentially the possession of every believer each individual must appropriate it for himself before it is experimentally his we may go still further than this and say that it is only by the baptism with the holy spirit that one becomes in the fullest sense a member of the body of christ because it is only by the baptism with the spirit that he receives power to perform those functions for which god has appointed him as a part of the body 
as we have already seen every true believer has the holy spirit romans chapter eight verse nine but not every believer has the baptism with the holy spirit though every believer may have as we have just seen it is one thing to have the holy spirit dwelling within us perhaps dwelling within us way back in some hidden sanctuary of our being back of definite consciousness and something far different something vastly more to have the holy spirit taking complete possession of the one whom he inhabits there are those who press the fact that every believer potentially has the baptism with the spirit to such an extent that they clearly teach that every believer has the baptism with the spirit as an actual experience but unless the baptism with the spirit today is something radically different from what the baptism with the spirit was in the early church indeed unless it is something not at all real then either a very large proportion of those whom we ordinarily consider believers are not believers or else one may be a believer and a regenerate man without having been baptized with the holy spirit certainly this was the case in the early church it was the case with the apostles before pentecost it was the case with the church in ephesus it was the case with the church in samaria and there are thousands to-day who can testify to having received christ and been born again and then afterwards sometimes long afterwards having been baptized with the holy ghost as a definite experience this is a matter of great practical importance for there are many who are not enjoying the fullness of privilege that they might enjoy because by pushing individual verses in the scriptures beyond what they will bear and against the plain teaching of the scriptures as a whole they are trying to persuade themselves that they have already been baptized with the holy spirit when they have not and if they would only admit to themselves that they have not they could then take the steps whereby they would be baptized with the holy spirit as a matter of definite personal experience the next thing which is clear from the teaching of scripture is that the baptism with the holy spirit is always connected with and primarily for the purpose of testimony and service our lord in speaking of this baptism which they were so soon to receive in luke chapter twenty four verse forty nine said and behold i send the promise of my father upon ye but tarry ye in the city of jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high and again he said in acts chapter one verses five and eight for john truly baptized with water but ye shall be baptized with the holy ghost not many days hence but ye shall receive power after that the holy ghost is come upon ye and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in jerusalem and in all judea and in samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth in the record of the fulfilment of this promise of our lord in acts chapter two verse four we read and they were all filled with the holy ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance then follows the detailed account of what peter said and of the result the result was that peter and the other apostles spoke with such power that three thousand persons that day were convicted of sin renounced their sin and confessed their acceptance of jesus christ in baptism and continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers ever afterwards in the fourth chapter of acts the thirty-first to the thirty-third verses we read that when the apostles on another occasion were filled with the holy spirit the results were that they spake the word of god with boldness and that with great power gave the apostles their witness to the resurrection of the lord jesus and in the ninth chapter of the acts of the apostles we have a description of paul's being baptized with the holy spirit we read in the seventeenth to the twentieth verses and ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said brother saul the lord even jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the holy ghost and immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized and when he had received meat he was strengthened and straightway he preached christ in the synagogues that he is the son of god and in the twenty-second verse we read that he confounded the jews which dwelt at damascus proving that this is the christ revised version in first corinthians chapter twelve we have the fullest description of the baptism with the holy spirit found in any passage in the bible this is the classical passage on the whole subject and the results there recorded are gifts for service the baptism with the holy spirit is not primarily intended to make believers happy but to make them useful it is not intended merely for the ecstasy of the individual believer it is intended primarily for his efficiency in service i do not say that the baptism with the holy spirit will not make the believer happy for as part of the fruit of the spirit is joy 
if one is baptized with the holy spirit joy must inevitably result i have never known one to be baptized with the holy spirit into whose life there did not come sooner or later a new joy a higher and purer and fuller joy than he had ever known before but this is not the prime purpose of the baptism nor the most important and prominent result great emphasis needs to be laid upon this point for there are many christians who in seeking the baptism with the spirit are seeking personal ecstasy and rapture they go to conventions and conferences for the deepening of the christian life and come back and tell what a wonderful blessing they have received referring to some new ecstasy that has come into their heart but when you watch them it is difficult to see that they are any more useful to their pastors or their churches than they were before and one is compelled to think that whatever they have received they have not received the real baptism with the holy spirit ecstasies and raptures are all right in their places when they come thank god for them the writer knows something about them but in a world such as we live in to-day where sin and self-righteousness and unbelief are so triumphant where there is such an awful tide of men women and young people sweeping on towards eternal perdition i would rather go through my whole life and never have one touch of ecstasy but have power to witness for christ and win others for christ and thus to save them than to have raptures three hundred and sixty-five days in the year but no power to stem the awful tide of sin and bring men women and children to a saving knowledge of my lord and saviour jesus christ the purpose of the baptism with the holy spirit is not primarily to make believers individually holy i do not say that it is not the work of the holy spirit to make believers holy for as we have already seen he is the spirit of holiness and the only way we shall ever attain unto holiness is by his power i do not even say that the baptism with the holy spirit will not result in a great spiritual transformation and uplift and cleansing for the promise is he shall baptize you with the holy spirit and fire and the thought of fire as used in this connection is the thought of searching refining cleansing consuming a wonderful transformation took place in the apostles at pentecost and a wonderful transformation has taken place in thousands who have been baptized with the holy spirit since pentecost but the primary purpose of the baptism with the holy spirit is efficiency in testimony and service it has to do rather with gifts for service than with graces of character it is the impartation of spiritual power or gifts in service and sometimes one may have rare gifts by the spirit's power and yet manifest few of the graces of the spirit see first corinthians chapter thirteen verses one to three matthew chapter seven verses twenty two and twenty three in every passage in the bible in which the baptism with the holy spirit is mentioned it is connected with testimony or service we shall perhaps get a clearer idea of just what the baptism with the holy spirit is if we stop to consider what are the results of the baptism of the holy spirit what are the results of the baptism with the holy spirit one the specific manifestations of the baptism with the holy spirit are not necessarily the same in all persons this appears very clearly from first corinthians chapter twelve verses four to thirteen now there are diversities of gifts but the same spirit and there are differences of administrations but the same lord and there are diversities of operations but it is the same god which worketh all in all but the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man for profit with all for to one is given the spirit of the word of wisdom to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit to another faith by the same spirit to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit to another the working of miracles to another prophecy to another discerning of spirits to another diverse kinds of tongues to another the interpretation of tongues but all these worketh that one and the same self spirit dividing to every man severally as he will for as the body is one and hath many members and all the members of that one body being many are one body so also is christ for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body whether we be jews or gentiles whether we be bond or free and have been all made to drink into one spirit here we see one baptism but a great variety of manifestations of the power of that baptism there are diversities of gifts but the same spirit the gifts vary with the different lines of service to which god calls different persons the church is a body and different members of the body have different functions and the spirit imparts to the one who is baptized with the spirit those gifts which fit him for the service to which god has called him it is very important to bear this in mind through the failure to see this many have gone entirely astray on the whole subject 
in my early study of the subject i noticed the fact that in many instances those who were baptized with the holy spirit spake with tongues for example acts chapter two verse four chapter ten verse forty six chapter nineteen verse six and i wondered if every one who was baptized with the holy spirit would not speak with tongues i did not know of any one who was speaking with tongues to-day and so i wondered still further whether the baptism with the holy spirit were for the present age but one day i was studying first corinthians chapter twelve and noticed how paul said to the believers in that wonderfully gifted church in corinth all of whom had been pronounced in the thirteenth verse to be baptized with the spirit and god had set some in the church first apostles secondarily prophets thirdly teachers after that miracles then gifts of healing helps governments diversities of tongues are all apostles are all prophets are all teachers are all workers of miracles have all the gift of healing do all speak with tongues do all interpret so i saw it was clearly taught in the scriptures that one might be baptized with the holy spirit and still not have the gift of tongues i saw furthermore that the gift of tongues according to the scripture was the last and the least important of all the gifts and that we were urged to desire earnestly the greater gifts first corinthians chapter thirteen verse thirty one first corinthians chapter fourteen verses five and twelve fourteen eighteen nineteen twenty seven and twenty eight a little later i was tempted to fall into another error more specious but in reality just as unscriptural as this namely that if one were baptized with the holy spirit he would receive the gift of an evangelist i had read the story of d l moody of charles g finney and of others who were baptized with the holy spirit and of the power that came to them as evangelists and the thought was suggested that if any one is baptized with the holy spirit will he not also obtain power as an evangelist but this was also unscriptural if god has called a man to be an evangelist and he is baptized with the holy spirit he will receive power as an evangelist but if god has called him to be something else he will receive power to become something else three great evils come from the error of thinking that every one who is baptized with the holy spirit will receive power as an evangelist one the evil of disappointment there are many who seek the baptism with the holy spirit expecting power as an evangelist but god has not called them to that work and though they really meet the conditions of receiving the baptism with the spirit and do receive the baptism with the spirit power as an evangelist does not come in many cases this results in bitter disappointment and sometimes even in despair the one who has expected the power of an evangelist and has not received it sometimes even questions whether he is a child of god but if he had properly understood the matter he would have known that the fact that he had not received power as an evangelist is no proof that he has not received the baptism with the spirit and much less is it proof that he is not a child of god two the second evil is graver still namely the evil of presumption a man whom god has not called to the work of an evangelist or a minister oftentimes rushes into it because he has received or imagines he has received the baptism with the holy spirit he thinks all a man needs to become a preacher is the baptism with the holy spirit this is not true in order to succeed as a minister a man needs a call to that specific work and furthermore he needs that knowledge of god's word that will prepare him for the work if a man is called to the ministry and studies the word until he has something to preach if then he is baptized with the holy spirit he will have success as a preacher but if he is not called to that work or if he has not the knowledge of the word of god that is necessary he will not succeed in the work even though he receives the baptism with the holy spirit three the third evil is greater still namely the evil of indifference there are many who know that they are not called to the work of preaching if then they think that the baptism with the holy spirit simply imparts power as an evangelist or power to preach the matter of the baptism with the holy spirit is one of no personal concern to them for example here is a mother with a large family of children she knows perfectly well or at least it is hoped that she knows that she is not called to do the work of an evangelist she knows that her duty lies with her children and her home if she reads or hears about the baptism with the holy spirit and gets the impression that the baptism with the holy spirit simply imparts power to do the work of an evangelist or to preach she will think the evangelist needs this blessing my minister needs this blessing but it is not for me but if she understands the matter as it is taught in the bible that while the baptism with the spirit imparts power 
the way in which the spirit will be manifested depends entirely upon the line of work to which god calls us and that no efficient work can be done without it and sees still further that there is no function in the church of jesus christ today more holy and sacred than that of sanctified motherhood she will say the evangelist may need this baptism my minister may need this baptism but i must have it to bring up my children in the nurture and admonition of the lord two while there are diversities of gifts and manifestations of the baptism with the holy spirit there will be some gift to every one thus baptized we read in first corinthians chapter twelve verse seven revised version but to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit to profit with all every most insignificant member of the body of christ has some function to perform in that body the body grows by that which every joint supplieth ephesians chapter four verse sixteen and to each least significant joint the holy spirit imparts power to perform the function that belongs to him three it is the holy spirit who decides how the baptism with the spirit shall manifest itself in any given case as we read in first corinthians chapter twelve verse eleven but all these worketh the one and the self same spirit dividing to each one severally even as he will the holy spirit is absolutely sovereign in deciding how that is in what special gift operation or power the baptism with the holy spirit shall manifest itself it is not for us to pick out some field of service and then ask the holy spirit to qualify us for that service it is not for us to select some gift and then ask the holy spirit to impart to us this self-chosen gift it is for us simply to put ourselves entirely at the disposal of the holy spirit to send us where he will to select for us what kind of service he will and to impart to us what gift he will he is absolutely sovereign and our position is that of unconditional surrender to him i am glad that this is so i rejoice that he in his infinite wisdom and love is to select the field of service and the gifts and that this is not to be left to me in my short-sightedness and folly it is because of the failure to recognize this absolute sovereignty of the spirit that many fail of the blessing and meet with disappointment they are trying to select their own gift and so get none i once knew of an earnest child of god in scotland who hearing of the baptism with the holy spirit and the power that resulted from it gave up at a great sacrifice his work as a ship plater for which he was receiving large wages he heard that there was a great need of ministers in the northwest in america he came to the northwest he met the conditions of the baptism with the holy spirit and i believe he was really baptized with the holy spirit but god had not chosen him for the work of an evangelist and the power as an evangelist did not come to him no field seemed open and he was in great despondency he even questioned his acceptance before god one morning he came into our church in minneapolis and heard me speak upon the baptism with the holy spirit and as i pointed out that the baptism with the holy spirit manifested itself in many different ways and the fact that one had not power as an evangelist was no proof that he had not received the baptism with the holy spirit light came into his heart he put himself unreservedly into god's hands for him to choose the field of labor and the gifts an opening soon came to him as a sunday school missionary and then when he had given up choosing for himself and left it with the holy spirit to divide to him as he would a strange thing happened he did receive power as an evangelist and went through the country districts in one of our northwestern states with mighty power as an evangelist four while the power may be of one kind in one person and of another kind in another person there will always be power the very power of god when one is baptized with the holy spirit we read in acts chapter one verses five and eight for john truly baptized with water but ye shall be baptized with the holy ghost not many days hence but ye shall receive power and after that the holy ghost is come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in jerusalem and in all judea and in samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth as truly as any one who reads these pages who has not already received the baptism with the holy spirit seeks it in god's way he will obtain it and there will come into his service a power that was never there before power for the very work to which god has called him this is not only the teaching of scripture it is the teaching of religious experience throughout the centuries religious biographies abound in instances of men who have worked along as best they could until one day they were led to see that there was such an experience as the baptism with the holy spirit 
and to seek it and obtain it and from that hour there came into their service a new power that utterly transformed its character in this matter one thinks first of men such as finney and moody and brainerd but cases of this character are not confined to the few exceptional men they are common the writer has personally met and corresponded with hundreds and thousands of persons around the globe who could testify definitely to the new power that god has granted them through the baptism with the holy spirit these thousands of men and women were in all branches of christian service some of them are ministers of the gospel some evangelists some mission workers some y m c a secretaries sunday school teachers fathers mothers personal workers nothing could possibly exceed the clearness and the confidence and the joyfulness of many of these testimonies i shall not soon forget a minister whom i met some years ago at a state convention of the young people's society of christian endeavor at new britain connecticut i was speaking on the subject of personal work and as i drew the address to a close i said that in order to do effective personal work we must be baptized with the holy spirit and in a very few sentences explained what i meant by that at the close of the address this minister came to me on the platform and said i have not this blessing you have been speaking about but i want it will you pray for me i said why not pray right now he said i will we put two chairs side by side and turned our backs upon the crowd as they passed out of the armory he prayed and i prayed that he might be baptized with the holy spirit then we separated some weeks after one who had witnessed the scene came to me at a convention in washington and told me how this minister had gone back to his church a transformed man that now his congregations filled the church that it was largely composed of young men and that there were conversions at every service some years after this minister was called to another field of service his most spiritually minded friends advised him not to go as all the ruling elements in the church to which he had been called were against aggressive evangelistic work but for some reason or other he felt it was the call of god and accepted it in six months there were sixty-nine conversions and thirty-eight of them were business men in the town after attending in montreal some years ago an interprovincial convention of the young men's christian association of the provinces of canada i received a letter from a young man he wrote i was present at your last meeting in montreal i heard you speak upon the baptism with the holy spirit i went to my rooms and sought that baptism for myself and received it i am chairman of the lookout committee of the christian endeavor society of our church i called together the other members of the committee i found that two of them had been at the meeting and had already been baptized with the holy spirit then we prayed for the other members of the committee and they were baptized with the holy spirit now we are going out into the church and the young people of the church are being brought to christ right along a lady and gentleman once came to me at a convention and told me how though they had never seen me before they had read the report of an address on the baptism with the holy spirit delivered in boston at a christian workers convention and that they had sought this baptism and had received it the man then told me the blessing that had come into his service as superintendent of the sunday school when he had finished his wife broke in and said yes and the very best part of it is i have been able to get into the hearts of my own children which i was never able to do before here were three distinctly different lines of service but there was power in each case the results of that power may not however be manifest at once in conversions stephen was filled with the holy spirit but as he witnessed in the power of the holy spirit for his risen lord he saw no conversions at the time all he saw was the gnashing of the teeth the angry looks and the merciless rocks and so it may be with us but there was a conversion even in that case though it was a long time before it was seen and that conversion the conversion of saul of tarsus was worth more than hundreds of ordinary conversions five another result of the baptism with the holy spirit will be boldness in testimony and service we read in acts chapter four verse thirty one and when they had prayed the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the holy ghost and they spake the word of god with boldness the baptism with the holy spirit imparts to those who receive it new liberty and fearlessness in testimony for christ it converts cowards into heroes peter upon the night of our lord's crucifixion proved himself a craven coward he denied with oaths and curses that he knew the lord but after pentecost this same peter was brought before the very council that had condemned jesus to death and he himself was threatened but filled with the holy ghost he said 
ye rulers of the people and elders of israel if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole be it known unto you all and to all the people of israel that by the name of jesus christ of nazareth whom ye crucified whom god raised from the dead even by him doth this man stand here before you whole this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders which has become the head of the corner neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved acts chapter four verses eight to twelve a little later when the council commanded him and his companion john not to speak or teach in the name of jesus they answered whether it be right in the sight of god to hearken unto you more than unto god judge ye for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard acts chapter four verses nineteen and twenty on a still later occasion when they were threatened and commanded not to speak and when their lives were in jeopardy peter told the council to their faces we ought to obey god rather than men the god of our fathers raised up jesus whom ye slew and hanged on a tree him hath god exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a saviour for to give repentance to israel and forgiveness of sins and we are his witnesses of these things and so is also the holy ghost whom god hath given to them that obey him acts chapter five verses twenty nine to thirty two the natural timidity of many a man to-day vanishes when he is filled with the holy spirit and with great boldness and liberty with utter fearlessness of consequences he gives his testimony for jesus christ six the baptism with the holy spirit causes the one who receives it to be occupied with god and christ and spiritual things in the record of the day of pentecost we read they were all filled with the holy ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance and they were all amazed and marvelled saying one to another behold are not these which speak galileans and how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born cretes and arabians we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of god acts chapter two verses four seven eight and eleven then follows peter's sermon a sermon that from start to finish is entirely taken up with jesus christ and his glory on a later day we read and when they had prayed the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the holy ghost and they spake the word of god with boldness and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the lord jesus and great grace was upon them all then peter filled with the holy ghost said unto them ye rulers of the people and elders of israel if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole be it known unto you and to all the people of israel that by the name of jesus of nazareth whom ye crucified whom god raised from the dead even by him doth this man stand before you whole acts chapter four verses thirty one thirty three and eight to ten we read of saul of tarsus that when he had been filled with the holy spirit straightway in the synagogues he proclaimed jesus acts chapter nine verses seventeen and twenty revised version we read of the house of cornelius while peter yet spake these words the holy ghost fell on them who heard the word and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with peter because that on the gentiles also was poured out the gift of the holy ghost for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify god here we see the whole household of cornelius as soon as they were filled with the holy spirit magnifying god in ephesians chapter five verses eighteen and nineteen we are told that the result of being filled with the spirit is that those who are thus filled will speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in their hearts to the lord men who are filled with the holy spirit will not be singing sentimental ballads not comic ditties nor operatic airs while the power of the holy ghost is upon them if the holy ghost should come upon any one while listening to one of the most innocent of the world's songs he would not enjoy it he would long to hear something about christ men who are baptized with the holy spirit do not talk much about self but much about god and especially much about christ this is necessarily so as it is the holy spirit's office to bear witness to the glorified christ john chapter fifteen verse twenty six chapter sixteen verse fourteen to sum up everything that has been said about the results of the baptism with the holy spirit the baptism with the holy spirit is the spirit of god coming upon the believer 
filling his mind with a real apprehension of truths especially of christ taking possession of his faculties imparting to him gifts not otherwise his but which qualify him for the service to which god has called him the necessity of the baptism with the spirit the new testament has much to say about the necessity for the baptism with the holy spirit when our lord was about to leave his disciples to go to be with the father he said and behold i send the promise of my father upon you but tarry ye in the city of jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high luke chapter twenty four verse forty nine he had just commissioned them to be his witnesses to all nations beginning at jerusalem verses forty seven and forty eight but here he tells them that before they undertake this witnessing they must wait until they receive the promise of the father and were thus endued with power from on high for the work of witnessing which they were to undertake there is no doubt as to what jesus meant by the promise of my father for which they were to wait before beginning the ministry that he had laid upon them for in acts chapter one verses four and five we read and being assembled together with them he commanded them that they should not depart from jerusalem but wait for the promise of the father which saith he ye have heard of me for john truly baptized with water but ye shall be baptized with the holy ghost not many days hence it is evident then that the promise of the father through which the endowment of power was to come was the baptism with the holy spirit he went on to tell his disciples ye shall receive power after that the holy ghost shall come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in jerusalem and in all judea and in samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth acts chapter one verse eight now who were the men to whom jesus said this the disciples whom he himself had trained for the work for more than three years they had lived in the closest intimacy with himself they had been eyewitnesses of his miracles of his death of his resurrection and in a few moments were to be eyewitnesses of his ascension as he was taken up right before their eyes into heaven and what were they to do simply to go and tell the world what their own eyes had seen and what their own ears had heard from the lips of the son of god were they not equipped for the work with our modern ideas of preparation for christian work we should say that they were thoroughly equipped but jesus said no you are not equipped there is another preparation in addition to the preparation already received so absolutely necessary for effective work that you must not stir one step until you receive it this other preparation is the promise of the father the baptism with the holy spirit if the apostles with their altogether exceptional fitting for the work which they were to undertake needed this preparation for work how much more do we in the light of what jesus required of his disciples before undertaking the work does it not seem like the most daring presumption for any of us to undertake to witness and work for christ until we have also received the promise of the father the baptism with the holy spirit there was apparently imperative need that something be done at once the whole world was perishing and they alone knew the saving truth nevertheless jesus strictly charged them wait could there be a stronger testimony to the absolute necessity and importance of the baptism with the holy spirit as a preparation for work that should be acceptable to christ but this is not all in acts chapter ten verse thirty eight we read how god anointed jesus of nazareth with the holy ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for god was with him to what does this refer in the recorded life of jesus christ if we will turn to luke chapter three verses twenty one and twenty two and luke chapter four verses one four seventeen and eighteen we will get our answer in luke chapter three verses twenty one and twenty two revised version we read that after jesus had been baptized and was praying the heaven was opened and the holy spirit descended in a bodily form as a dove upon him and a voice came out of heaven thou art my beloved son in thee i am well pleased then the next thing that we read with nothing intervening but the human genealogy of jesus is and jesus full of the holy spirit returned from the jordan and was led by the spirit in the wilderness luke chapter four verse one then follows the story of his temptation then in the fourteenth verse we read and jesus returned in the power of the spirit into galilee and a fame went out concerning him through all the region round about and in the seventeenth and eighteenth verses and there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet isaiah 
and he opened the book and found the place where it was written the spirit of the lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach etc evidently then it was at the jordan in connection with his baptism that jesus was anointed with the holy spirit and power and he did not enter upon his public ministry until he was thus baptized with the holy spirit and who was jesus it is the common belief of christendom that he had been supernaturally conceived through the holy spirit's power that he was the only begotten son of god that he was divine very god of very god and yet truly man if such a one leaving us an example that we should follow his steps did not venture upon his ministry for which the father had sent him until thus definitely baptized with the holy spirit what is it for us to dare to do it if in the light of these recorded facts we dare to do it does it not seem like the most unpardonable presumption doubtless it has been done in ignorance by many of us but can we plead ignorance any longer it is evident that the baptism with the holy spirit is an absolutely necessary preparation for effective work for christ along every line of service we may have a clear call to service as clear it may be as the apostles had but the charge is laid upon us as upon them that before we begin that service we must tarry until we are clothed with power from on high this endowment of power is through the baptism with the holy spirit but this is not all even yet we read in acts chapter seven verses fourteen to sixteen now when the apostles which were at jerusalem heard that samaria had received the word of god they sent unto them peter and john who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the holy ghost for as yet he was fallen upon none of them only they were baptized in the name of the lord jesus there was a great company of happy converts in samaria but when peter and john came down to inspect the work they evidently felt that there was something so essential that these young disciples had not received that before they did anything else they must see to it that they received it in a similar way we read in acts chapter nineteen verses one and two revised version and it came to pass that while apollos was at corinth paul having passed through the upper country came to ephesus and found certain disciples and he said unto them did you receive the holy ghost when you believed when he found that they had not received the holy spirit the first thing he saw too was that they should receive the holy spirit he did not go on with the work with the outsiders until that little group of twelve disciples had been equipped for service so we see that when the apostles found believers in christ the first thing that they always did was to demand whether they had received the holy spirit as a definite experience and if not they saw to it at once that the steps were taken whereby they should receive the holy spirit it is evident then that the baptism with the holy spirit is absolutely necessary in every christian for the service that christ demands and expects of him there are certainly few greater mistakes that we are making today in our various christian enterprises than that of setting men to teach sunday school classes and do personal work and even to preach the gospel because they have been converted and received a certain amount of education including it may be a college and seminary course but have not as yet been baptized with the holy spirit we think that if a man is hopefully pious and has a college and seminary education and comes out of it reasonably orthodox he is now ready that we should lay our hands upon him and ordain him to preach the gospel but jesus christ says no there is another preparation so all essential that a man must not undertake this work until he has received it tarry ye literally sit ye down until ye be endued with power from on high a distinguished theological professor has said that the question ought to be put to every candidate for the ministry have ye met god yes but we ought to go farther than this and be even more definite to every candidate for the ministry we should put the question have you been baptized with the holy spirit and if not we should say to him as jesus said to the first preachers of the gospel sit down until you are endued with power from on high but not only is this true of ordained ministers it is true of every christian for all christians are called to ministry of some kind any man who is in christian work who has not received the baptism with the holy spirit ought to stop his work right where he is and not go on with it until he has been clothed with power from on high but what will our work do while we are waiting the question can be answered by asking another what did the world do during these ten days while the early disciples were waiting they knew the saving truth they alone knew it 
yet in obedience to the lord's command they were silent the world was no loser beyond a doubt when the power came they accomplished more in one day than they would have accomplished in years if they had gone on in self-confident defiance and disobedience to christ's command we too after we have received the baptism with the spirit will accomplish more of real work for our lord in one day than we ever would in years without this power even if it were necessary to spend days in waiting they would be well spent but we shall see later that there is no need that we spend days in waiting that the baptism with the holy spirit may be received to-day some one may say that the apostles had gone on missionary tours during christ's lifetime even before they were baptized with the holy spirit this is true but that was before the holy spirit was given and before the command was given tarry ye until ye be clothed with power from on high after that it would have been disobedience and folly and presumption to have gone forth without this endowment and we are living to-day after the holy spirit has been given and after the charge has been given to tarry until clothed who can be baptized with the holy spirit we come now to the question of first importance namely who can be baptized with the holy spirit at a convention some years ago a very intelligent christian woman a well-known worker in educational as well as sunday school work sent me this question you have told us of the necessity of the baptism with the holy spirit but who can have this baptism the church to which i belong teaches that the baptism with the holy spirit was confined to the apostolic age will you not tell us who can have the baptism with the holy spirit fortunately this question is answered in the most explicit terms in the bible we read in acts chapter two verses thirty eight and thirty nine revised version and peter said unto them repent ye and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ unto the remission of your sins and ye shall receive the gift of the holy ghost for to you is the promise and to your children and to all that are afar off even as many as the lord our god shall call unto him what is the promise to which peter refers in the thirty ninth verse there are two interpretations of the passage one is that the promise of this verse is the promise of salvation the other is that the promise of this verse is the promise of the gift of the holy spirit or the baptism with the holy spirit a comparison of scripture passages will show that the two expressions are synonymous which is the correct interpretation there are two laws of interpretation universally recognized among bible scholars these two laws are the law of usage or usus loquendi as it is called and the law of context many a verse in the bible standing alone might admit of two or three or even more interpretations but when these two laws of interpretation are applied it is settled to a certainty that only one of the various possible interpretations is the true interpretation the law of usage is this that when you find a word or phrase in any passage of scripture and you wish to know what it means do not go to a dictionary but go to the bible itself look up the various passages in which the word is used and especially how the particular writer being studied uses it and especially how it is used in that particular book in which the passage is found thus you can determine what the precise meaning of the word or phrase is in the passage in question the law of context is this that when you study a passage you should not take it out of its connection but should look at what goes before it and what comes after it for while it might mean various things if it stood alone it can only mean one thing in the connection in which it is found now let us apply these two laws to the passage in question first of all let us apply the law of usage we are trying to discover what the expression the promise means in acts chapter two verse thirty nine turning back to acts chapter one verses four and five revised version we read he charged them not to depart from jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the father which said he ye heard from me for john indeed baptized with water but ye shall be baptized with the holy ghost not many days hence it is evident then that here the promise of the father means the baptism with the holy spirit turn now to the second chapter and thirty-third verse revised version being therefore by the right hand of god exalted and having received of the father the promise of the holy ghost he hath poured forth this which ye see and hear in this passage we are told in so many words that the promise is the promise of the holy spirit if this peculiar expression means the baptism with the holy spirit in acts chapter one verses four and five and the same thing in acts chapter two verse thirty three 
by what same law of interpretation can it possibly mean something entirely different six verses farther down in acts chapter two verse thirty nine so the law of usage establishes it that the promise of acts chapter two verse thirty nine is the promise of the baptism with the holy spirit now let us apply the law of context and we shall find that if possible this is even more decisive turn back to the thirty eighth verse and peter said unto them repent ye and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ unto the remission of your sins and ye shall receive the gift of the holy ghost for the promise is unto you etc so it is evident here that the promise is the promise of the gift or baptism with the holy spirit it is settled then by both laws that the promise of acts chapter two verse thirty nine is that of the gift of the holy spirit or baptism with the holy spirit let us then read the verse in that way substituting the synonymous expression for the expression the promise for the baptism with the holy spirit is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off even as many as the lord god shall call it is unto you says peter that is to the crowd assembled before him there is nothing in that for us we were not there and the crowd were all jews and we are not jews but peter did not stop there he goes on further and says and to your children that is to the next generation of jews or all future generations of jews still there is nothing in it for us for we are not jews but peter did not stop even there he went further and said and to all them that are afar off that does take us in we are the gentiles who were once afar off but now made nigh by the blood of christ ephesians chapter two verses thirteen and seventeen but lest there be any mistake about it whatever peter adds even as many as the lord our god shall call unto him so on the very day of pentecost peter declares that the baptism with the holy spirit is for every child of god in every coming age of the church's history some years ago at a ministerial conference in chicago a minister of the gospel from the southwest came to me after a lecture on the baptism with the holy spirit and said the church to which i belong teaches that the baptism with the holy spirit was for the apostolic age alone i do not care i replied what the church to which you belong teaches or what the church to which i belong teaches the only question with me is what does the word of god teach that is right he said i then handed him my bible and asked him to read acts chapter two verse thirty nine and he read for the promise is unto you and unto your children and to all them that are afar off even as many as the lord our god shall call unto him revised version has he called you i asked yes he certainly has is the promise for you then yes it is he took it and the result was a transformed ministry some years ago at a students conference the gatherings were presided over by a prominent episcopalian minister a man greatly honored and loved i spoke at this conference on the baptism with the holy spirit and dwelt upon the significance of acts chapter two verse thirty nine that night as we sat together after the meetings were over this servant of god said to me brother tory i was greatly interested in what you had to say today on the baptism with the holy spirit if your interpretation of acts chapter two verse thirty nine is correct you have your case but i doubt your interpretation of acts chapter two verse thirty nine let us talk it over we did talk it over several years later in july eighteen ninety four i was at the students conference at northfield as i entered the back door of stone hall that day this episcopalian minister entered the front door seeing me he hurried across the hall and held out his hand and said you are right about acts chapter two verse thirty nine at knoxville and i believe i have a right to tell you something better yet that i have been baptized with the holy spirit i am glad that i was right about acts chapter two verse thirty nine not that it is of any importance that i should be right but the truth thus established is of immeasurable importance is it not glorious to be able to go literally around the world and face audiences of believers all over the united states in the sandwich islands in australia and tasmania and new zealand in china and japan and india in england and scotland ireland germany france and switzerland and to be able to tell them and to know that you have god's sure word under your feet when you do tell them you may all be baptized with the holy spirit but that unspeakably joyous and glorious thought has its solemn side if we may be baptized with the holy spirit then we must be if we are baptized with the holy spirit 
then souls will be saved through our instrumentality who will not be saved if we are not thus baptized if then we are not willing to pay the price of this baptism and therefore we are not thus baptized we shall be responsible before god for every soul that might have been saved who was not saved because we did not pay the price and therefore did not obtain the blessing i often tremble for myself and for my brethren in the ministry and not only for my brethren in the ministry but for all my brethren in all forms of christian work even the most humble and obscure why because we are preaching error no alas there are many in these dark days who are doing that and i do tremble for them but that is not what i mean now do i mean that i tremble because we are not preaching the truth for it is quite possible not to preach error and yet not preach the truth many a man has never preached a word of error in his life but still is not preaching the truth and i do tremble for them but that is not what i mean now i mean that i tremble for those of us who are preaching the truth the very truth as it is in jesus the truth as it is recorded in the written word of god the truth in its simplicity its purity its fullness but who are preaching it in persuasive words of man's wisdom and not in demonstration of the spirit and of power first corinthians chapter two verse four revised version preaching it in the energy of the flesh and not in the power of the holy spirit there is nothing more death dealing than the gospel without the spirit's power the letter killeth but the spirit giveth life it is awfully solemn business preaching the gospel either from the pulpit or in more quiet ways it means death or life to those that hear and whether it means death or life depends very largely on whether we preach it with or without the baptism of the holy spirit we must be baptized with the holy spirit even after one has been baptized with the holy spirit no matter how definite that baptism may be he needs to be filled again and again with the spirit this is the clear teaching of the new testament we read in acts chapter 2 verse 4 they were all filled with the holy ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance now one of those who was present on this occasion and who therefore was filled at this time with the holy spirit was peter indeed he stands forth most prominently in the chapter as a man baptized with the holy spirit but we read in acts chapter four verse eight then peter filled with the holy ghost said unto them etc here we read again that peter was filled with the holy ghost further down in the chapter we read in the thirty-first verse that being assembled together and praying they were all filled with the holy ghost and they spake the word of god with boldness we are expressly told in the context that two of those present were john and peter here then was a third instance in which peter was filled with the holy ghost it is not enough that one be filled with the holy spirit once we need a new filling for each emergency of christian service the failure to realize this need of constant refillings with the holy spirit has led to many a man who at one time was greatly used of god being utterly laid aside there are many to-day who once knew what it was to work in the power of the holy spirit who have lost their unction and their power i do not say that the holy spirit has left them i do not believe he has but the manifestation of his presence and power has gone one of the saddest sights among us to-day is that of the men and women who once toiled for the master in the mighty power of the holy spirit who are now practically of no use or even a hindrance to the work because they are trying to go in the power of the blessing received a year or five years or twenty years ago for each new service that is to be conducted for each new soul that is to be dealt with for each new work for christ that is to be performed for each new day and each new emergency of christian life and service we should seek and obtain a new filling with the holy spirit we must not neglect the gift that is in us first timothy chapter four verse fourteen but on the contrary kindle anew or stir into flame this gift first timothy chapter one verse six revised version margin repeated fillings with the holy spirit are necessary to continuance and increase of power the question may arise shall we call these new fillings with the holy spirit fresh baptisms with the holy spirit to this we would answer the expression baptism is never used in the scriptures of a second experience and there is something of an initiatory character in the very thought of baptism so if one wishes to be precisely biblical it would seem to be better not to use the term baptism for a second experience but to limit it to the first experience on the other hand filled with the holy spirit 
is used in acts chapter two verse four to describe the experience promised in acts chapter one verse five where the words used are ye shall be baptized with the holy ghost and it is evident from this and from other passages that the two expressions are to a large extent practically synonymous however if we confine the expression the baptism of the holy spirit to our first experience we shall be more exactly biblical and it would be well to speak of one baptism but many fillings but i would a great deal rather that one should speak about new or fresh baptisms with the holy spirit standing for the all-important truth that we need repeated fillings with the holy spirit than that he should so insist on exact phraseology that he would lose sight of the truth that repeated fillings are needed i e i would rather have the right experience by a wrong name than the wrong experience by the right name this much is as clear as day that we need to be filled again and again and again with the holy spirit i am sometimes asked have you received the second blessing yes and the third and the fourth and the fifth and hundreds beside and i am looking for a new blessing to-day chapter twenty part one